Hello everybody, my name is Pamela Nuri and uh, we have with us here today Ian Bullock from Wales and we are going to be talking a little bit about birding around the world. Now Ian has been an expedition staff member and onboard uh, birder for three decades. Hey Ian, I think. Um, I've certainly been lucky enough to work with you for many of the last decade and um, apart from being a top global bird, I have to mention that Ian is a very talented illustrator. And if you have been on board the Hebridean Sky, you'll have been lucky enough to have seen many of his absolutely wonderful wildlife diagrams and drawings all over, especially Deck 4 is the one that I love most. And I would just want to mention that you're also a fantastic stargazer because I know on some of the trips we do, if we're lucky enough to be in an area where there's good stargazing, you've always brought that really alive for us as well. So, hi Ian, how are you? I'm very well. Pleased to see you. Good. Yeah, very nice to see you as well. So, the idea for this naturalist chat was the birds that we could see around the world. If someone was a keen birder and that's one of the main reasons they were coming on those voyages. What are the different highlights of the different areas that we go to? What are you really watching out for? Or maybe which areas should you really aim for in your birding wish list? Yep, I've, what I thought we'd do is just run through some of the areas that are coming up, potential trips in the coming years. And just quickly, I'm gonna pick out some of the most exciting birds from there and why I love those places. That sounds perfect. So what have you, uh, what have you got lined up for us? Well, you know, let's start with UK where I am because we do these trips up the West Coast and they're just fabulous. They get us to some of the outlying islands on the stormy West Coast of Britain, but they, because they're remote outlying islands, they got fantastic wildlife there. So I thought, let's start with one of the most dramatic when we set off from the coast, we end up on the outer Hebrides and we take a kick out into the Atlantic and we get to this place here, which is St. Kilda. And this is, this is a double World Heritage Site, partly because it was occupied for 4,000 odd years, and uh, the people were only moved off in 1930, and also because it's got phenomenal seabirds there. So let's just look at some of those seabirds we can see. In the foreground here, you've got this spectacular bird, the gannet. And these are plunge divers, and because the sea is so rich there, we can see this kind of activity. And of course, the other bird that everybody wants to see up there, which is almost the poster child for the West Coast, is the puffin. Oh, the nice one. That is stuff in the beach. So, and also with some of these trips, we don't just do the Western Isles, we may do exciting things, go up to Shetland, kick off to the Faroes, and even end up in places like Iceland, which is the world headquarters for the puffin. Yeah, I must say, Ian, the last couple of years have been so fantastic with the puffins, particularly in the UK. We've had such fantastic sightings and abundance of puffins. I know it sort of comes and goes. Um, some years aren't as good as others, but the last few years have been amazing. Well, it's money back if you don't see a puffin on those trips. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the next one I thought we'd talk about is uh, we do some of these wonderful tropical trips. And uh, I have to say that Madagascar, here's a map of Madagascar, is one of the most extraordinary. And this is a chunk that broke off from Africa when India tore away. And because all this happened about 90 million years ago, it's got the most extraordinary biodiversity and things you'll find nowhere else in the world. And uh, just for example, you see that dark blue line all down the east side of the island? That's where the rainforest is. And a lot of the forest is gone, but a lot of it is still there. And we find those most dramatic places. And we look for incredible birds like these. You've got such strange birds in Madagascar. This is the helmet vanga. Have you ever seen anything like that? And in that same family of the vangas, you wouldn't even believe they're related. Look at this is the sickle bill vanga. Yeah, they don't look very alike at all. That's a, they're such spectacular birds and these like really exquisite exclusive birds in Madagascar aren't that well known such as some of the Central America species. But I always have a laugh in Madagascar because they've got a lot of species that look just like the ones we have on the mainland in Africa 
but there'll be mm. their whole own Madagascar variety and a whole known species. It's everything there is virtually, uh, virtually everything is endemic there. It's true. Yeah, I mean, these birds, there's about 200 species you can see and half of them uh, you'll find nowhere else. Really weird things like cuckoo rollers and cooers, all kinds of funny names. The other great thing about Madagascar, it's got a um, hundred different species of chameleon. You know, half of all the chameleons seen in the world. Look at this thing. We, we remember seeing these just on the roadside pan, yeah? Just, you know, you was, we used to stop the little buses and things, and there would be one of these panther chameleons. Yeah, incredible, really. Yeah, I must say the so, guides are so talented at spotting these things. At, you know, you'd be driving at sort of 100 kilometers an hour, and the guides would be like, Roar! and stop the bus to jump out and, and show you a chameleon. They're very talented with that. Yeah, from big chameleons like this, right down to the tiny Brookesia, you know, which is the smallest chameleon in the world, barely bigger than a beetle. So, yeah, also from Madagascar then, let's, uh, there's trips coming up in Central America, and this is an extraordinary part of the world. Most of the migrant birds from America go down to Central America and are packed into those little countries like Guatemala, Belize, Honduras. Nicaragua is fascinating, very strange place. You see women sitting around in hammocks smoking cigars. <laughs> but Costa Rica is one of my favorites. It's one of the loveliest places. And uh, one of the first trips I ever did there when I was younger was to go and see this amazing bird, the resplendent Quetzal. Not just resplendent, but iridescent. Look at that plumage. Oh yeah, just it really is amazing. It I mean, seems that so many of the birders, uh, certainly where I come from, they all want to flock, excuse the expression, flock to Central America. That seems to be a big area where you can tick off many, many species. Am I right? Yes, well, just, just think about this group, the hummingbirds. You know, even in, uh, in a, a country like Panama alone, and we sometimes do trips through the Panama Canal, there's 60 different species of these. This is the rufous crested coquette. And, and look at this lovely one as well, um, which is a, a purple throated violet star. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Now, 60 species of hummingbird there. We are lucky we don't go to Ecuador where there's 77 species. Yeah, that's I mean, incredible. It, it's a fabulous place, it really is. So, it's wonderful the way our little ships will take us to the extraordinary story and nowhere more wonderful than the South Pacific. I think we planned the trip to the South Pacific next year, Pam, is that right? Yeah, normally every year around April, May and again October we have the opportunity to do um, some of these South Pacific trips and they are, they really are covering a huge distance um, of longitude and there's so many spectacular islands along the way. Now this is classic picture, as close as we get to paradise really, there's 25,000 islands in the Pacific which takes up one third of the planet. Now sometimes we do trips from New Zealand up via Papua New Guinea to Philippines but uh, I think some of the favorite routes for us are like Solomon's Vanuatu Fiji and then Fiji, Tonga, Cook Islands, Cooks to Kiribati to Tahiti and the last amazing one, which is Tahiti, Pitcairn, Easter Island. And we can see um, just the amazing birds there too. Look at this bird. It's the orange dove. It's completely day glow orange. I mean, <laughs> you'll only see that in Fiji, it's nowhere else. And in the same set of uh, rainforests there in Fiji, you've got this, the golden dove. I mean, <laughs> when I think about our wood pigeon and the pigeons we've got, there is nothing like this anywhere. <laughs> the LBJ pink pigeons where I come from, yeah. <laughs> They'd be embarrassed if they saw this. <laughs> Tropical stuff. They've really gone to town with their paint pots. They really have. You know, they're just fabulous colors. Yeah. And when we get across, you know, to the far eastern side of the Pacific, then we get places where you just cannot get there except by ship. There's no airstrip on these islands. And of course, this is the famous story, the mutiny, the bounty. This is Pitcairn, Pitcairn Island. I mean, they've just designated a huge area, a um, third of a million square miles around that, the British government has to protect it for pristine seas. Yeah, uh, Pitcairn Islands, we're quite lucky with. It's one of those um, hard to land 
islands that we have quite a good success rate with, but it is. It's a very small exposed blimp of an island. But then you've got the other um, islands in the group, Henderson, Ducey, Aino, with their bird colonies. Those are incredible as well. We were so lucky. Remember the time we managed to get into Aino through incredible surf and down to the reckless bravery of our Zodiac drivers? <laughs> that was something, really. Yeah, that but, was a coup. Yeah, these places have uh, birds that are nowhere else as well. Look at this. This is one bird, the Pitcairn Reed Warbler. It's a kind of far colored, you know, not, that's not found anywhere else, only found on that one little island. And, uh, you know, further west where we go, you know, to places like French Polynesia, this is a fabulous little parakeet, the aquamarine lorikeet. It's tiny and it's just beautiful. Wow, yeah, so, that is nice that you put it there with the palm leaf so you can actually see how tiny that thing is. It's absolutely gorgeous. Well, they come down and feed on bananas. So if you've got, if you've got a rotten banana, just hold it up and you'll get one of these things flying down to you probably. Oh, nice. dear. Anyway, I have to say, you know, this area beats all, isn't it? Um, and now regularly we're doing trips to Antarctica. I'm lucky enough to have done four seasons down there monitoring penguins. And it's like nowhere else on the planet, I must admit. And uh, this this place, of course, we go there. You may see five, six, six species of penguins regularly on the trips we do down there. And um, this is a chart I've drawn to show all the wildlife we can see. You can see top left, we kick off from the bottom end of Argentina. We cross the dreaded Drake Passage, and that's a place to see all the albatrosses. You can see six maybe seven different species of albatross on that trip across there. And then we come down to the peninsula by the South Shetlands, and that's where we see all the penguins, you know, maybe six or seven species of penguin if we're lucky. And then if you do the longer three week trip, which is right around the whole circuit, then you kick off to South Orkneys and then up to South Georgia, which is for any seabird, um, not, that is the mecca. There's, there's nothing like it. There's a wonderful king penguins, that bright yellow penguin you see up there in the middle, middle right, and there's just a whole host of wildlife. So my favorite down there is this fabulous little bird, the Adelie penguin. It's the Charlie Chaplin of the penguin world. It's so focused. Yeah. They're absolutely busy the whole time. <laughs> They I are love so it. comical. I don't know why it is. I think it's because of the bipedal way that they walk that people relate better to them when they're just so hilarious. But I think the best part about Antarctic is how the animals are so unafraid of you. And this idea of these big, you know, meter tall king penguins, and they'll just walk right on up to you and look up at you and they'll be standing right next to you and you actually back away because we have these distance rules. But They'll just walk right up to you and have a look at you, and it's just, it just takes your breath away. It's wonderful, isn't it? They're so focused on what they do, they really are. So we love the Adeli penguins. And, uh, and also, you know, for somebody who comes from the north, you know, some of the jobs I've had in the past as a biologist is count all the Arctic terns in a group of islands. And it's just extraordinary to see our Arctic tern down there where they go for their winter holidays. And that trip, when they go down and back up, that can be a 45, 46,000 mile round trip. Think of the air miles in that. Um, in a lifetime, we know these birds live 30 years. They, that's equivalent to three trips to the moon, Pam. Three Just trips to the moon, yeah, that's incredible. I remember, I was thinking of that statistic now, I didn't remember the figure, but it really, really is staggering to see the Arctic turns down in the Antarctic every year. Well, I thought also just it's worth talking about some of the places that you could only get to by ship. And for those I'm thinking about um, this trip, we sometimes do up the Atlantic, the mid-Atlantic trip, um, visiting those Atlantic islands. And these are the last tiny remnant gems, the jewels of the British Empire, starting with this incredible place, you know, which is Tristan de Cunha, only discovered in the early 1500s. And that is the most remote occupied island in the world, 1,500 miles from any other continent. And a fabulous place too, because that's got right up on the top of this hill, above that tiny settlement, which is Edinburgh of the Seven Seas, you get this. This would be the seventh albatross you could see on that trip, the yellow-nosed albatross. Look at that, absolutely beautiful. 
And also there's one other nutty penguin up there. <laughs> Get a look at this for a hairstyle. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's one, that's the northern rock hopper, you know, and uh, I mean plumes. That has just gone completely over the top with the hairdo. I don't know how long they have to spend keeping that in good condition. But we start going up through the middle Tristan to Cunha. And then after that, we get to Santa Lina, which again, you could only ever get to by a ship, you know, a couple of ships a year used to go there. But our fleet will get us to there. And there's a funny little bird they call the wirebird, a kind of plover, which they're very proud of. They stick it on all their stamps. And if you can see those microscopic stamps. And from there on, we kick on north to Ascension Island, you know, which was key in the Falklands War. And that, that was, really had a real problem with cats and they've cleared the cats off in recent years, and that means a big increase in these tropical birds, like the wonderful frigate birds. This is the Ascension frigate, and also there's boobies there. But the other wonderful thing about that, if we go get onto Ascension, which we usually can, we go out at night and we see these green turtles coming in to lay their eggs. And they go Incredible. and feed off the coast of Brazil yeah. all the way back every year, a thousand, over a thousand miles to Ascension. Yeah. This uh, particular trip you're talking about is normally around, say, March, April, and yeah, goes dots all the way from Ushuaia, Falkland, South Georgia, and then dots all the way up these Atlantic islands. Uh, really, a lot of big hits uh, islands to get to, not to mention the species that you can find on them. Quite amazing. I think we finish in Senegal. Is it Dakar? You know, when the trip finishes, that's, that's an amazing transect of the entire Atlantic Ocean. And uh, so uh, I think that's really, I just wanted to celebrate what our extraordinary fleet of ships can do. You know, that's the Caledonian sky and that sky fleet in the Caledonian, um, Hebridean and Ireland. I mean, they've taken us to some wonderful places, Pam. Yeah, they, they really have been. And I think um, I've actually spent more time on some of these ships in, than, in my, than in my own home. So Ian, thank you so much for your time. That was such a nice little run around the globe with you, places many of which we've been to uh, together. And I certainly look forward to the next time we get to do those trips together, particularly, I think, that Atlantic one. <laughs> oh, that's special. Yeah. We are so lucky, aren't we? And yeah. also we get to do the fun bit, which is driving Zodiacs too. And I mean, that is the key to it, isn't it? You can travel on a ship, but we will go that bit further. We We'll uh, put you in a Zodiac safely and get you ashore into places which you, some places you can't even land. You know, think of some of those Pacific islands where you know only only shipwrecked people get to see. Yeah. We can land safely on them and bring you home. Isn't it? Yeah, and I mean, along with the privilege of getting to go to these absolutely remote, spectacular places, um, comes this idea that we hopefully become ambassadors for retaining the wilderness and the beauty and the pristine nature of these islands and the communities that live there. And that's a, a big uh, important part of it for us as well. Well, Noble Caledonia has got a good record, hasn't it? You know, it has very conservation projects. We've supported projects in South Georgia. We helped uh, our lovely Filipino crew, wasn't it, after the tsunami. And, uh, and you know, we're doing that kind of thing all over the world. Not until you've seen these things can you really learn to love them. And if you love them, then you care about them. And if you care about them, by God, you want to save them. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Well, Ian, thank you so much. That was a, a really great little uh, chat. I'm sure a lot of the guests who will recognize you from trips in the past will appreciate seeing you um, and also all the information. So you have a lovely day and thanks again. Not at all, Pam. Enjoy yourself. Take and, care. Uh, Bye. Can't wait till we're on the water again. <laughs>